program. We are very pleased to have Janet Davis of Hill House Nursery live with us tonight. Janet's presentation is part of a webinar, webinar series uh, brought to you by the Plant Virginia Natives Marketing Partnership, a collaborative uh, and statewide initiative to increase the use and drive an increase in the availability of the beautiful variety of plants native to Virginia for their numer numerous economic, ecological, and aesthetic benefits. The uh, Virginia Coastal Zone Management Program initiated and has been coordinating the partnership through grants from NOAA since the first regional marketing campaign on Virginia's Eastern Shore was launched over a decade ago. Plan Virginia Natives now engages and connects over 150 local, regional, and state partners across the state. I wanna call out a few for their role in making tonight's webinar possible. Our Zoom host, Blue Ridge Prism, and the Lewis Ginter Botanical Garden, which handled registration for our 2000 plus audience. Our facilitator tonight is Margaret Fisher with the Plant Nova Natives campaign, Nicole Hirsch with the New River Valley Regional Commission in Southwest Virginia, and Stacy Moles with the Virginia Department of Transportation's Pollinator Habitat Program. They will be helping Janet respond to as many of your questions as is possible. Finally, thank you to our attendees who have helped make this series a reality. As I mentioned, there is a little housekeeping we need to keep in mind. And I will turn this over now to Beth Mizell with Blue Ridge Prism to take us through the world of Zoom. Okay, thank you, Virginia. I'm gonna, if you could uh, stop sharing your screen. Absolutely, let me do that. And then I'll share my screen. Pull up a little handy slide. Okay, thank you, Virginia. And thanks to each of you for joining us today. Um, we have uh, over 700 people. I lost the, the number was just in front of me, but seven to 800 people today, which is an incredible response. Um, and we'll try to answer as many of your questions as, as we possibly can during the time we have together this evening. So just a reminder that this is a Zoom webinar and each participant will be muted and there is no participant video. So uh, you can see us, but we can't see you and you will not have the ability to unmute yourself. Um, I'll just take a, a second to go through the slide here. Um, so Zoom does offer some features and uh, the chat box, we're going to disable the chat box today uh, for the meeting. Um, and we, we ask you to direct your questions to the Q&A box. And that can be found um, on the, at the bottom of your screen, Q&A. And if you click on the two little bubbles, you'll see the Q&A box. And you can enter your question for the speaker there. Um, we ask you to direct all of your questions to the Q&A box um, that you have today. And if you can't find the Q&A, hover your cursor at the bottom of the Zoom window and it should pop up and then you can click it to open. And just a reminder that we do have a large audience and we'll do our best to answer as many questions as possible. Thank you. And actually we have uh, 1,100 1, participants this evening. So thanks everyone. I'll stop sharing. Okay, thank you, Beth. Um, so as Virginia mentioned, my name is Margaret Fisher, and uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker tonight. Janet Davis received a bachelor's degree in horticulture from Virginia Tech and has spent her entire working career growing something, fruit, veggie gardens, indoor plants, herbs, landscape plants, and her daughter, Olivia, who's now 15. Now known as the cheerleader for native plants, Janet operates Hill House Farm and Nursery, which grows and sells only U.S. native plants, primarily mid-Atlantic natives and select cultivars. She also offers landscape design and consultation services. So without further ado, I turn it over to Janet. Wow, thanks, Margaret. 
Oh, let me know if you can't hear me or I'm giving a big fancy lecture to all you fabulous people who've joined us tonight and I have never done this where um, you can see my screen and apparently me as well. So, hey, um, thanks a lot, everybody, for joining us. Over a thousand of you are here and I got to say, I am, I feel like a rock star. So thank you very much. But I'm really here because I want to share with you my passion and what I believe is not just my vocation and how I earn my living, but my avocation and what I love. And we're going to spend a good hour or more talking about um, how you can incorporate more native plants into your garden. And I'm hoping that every last one of you were here on Friday evening uh, at the webinar listening to Doug Tallamy talking about the more about the why native and what's the big deal and why why should we have these plants rather than the general stuff that we've always had uh, i'm going to talk a little bit about more about that tonight but if you've uh, heard him speak or if you know a little bit more already about native plants you're uh, uh, ahead of us uh ready to rare and to go and and uh, talk about where you can get these plants into your landscape um i get the question a lot from customers and clients they say you know i want a year-round garden <laughs> i want something blooming all the time here it is so if that's all we need then i'm gonna go home for the night um no 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 just kidding um just a little snapshot of uh what we've been through this winter which is an awful lot of snow and ice uh lots of little uh winter events that uh was a bit of a, a new one for us. We haven't had that for a long time. And I know that all of you are itching and raring to go and get some plants out there and get out in the garden. And this week, um, where I live uh, in Rappahannock County, Virginia, Northwest Virginia, west of say Warrington, Virginia, uh, we had close to 70 today. So I am uh, looking at the picture on the left. I took that actually earlier today and I am uh, really anxious to get out there. While I'm showing you these pictures, I do wanna mention on the left, the uh, photograph there that I just took today. Notice that I have not trimmed up any stalks or any dead plant material from last year. Uh, if you have not heard this before, it bears worth repeating that an awful lot of the creatures that we are trying to support and encourage and give habitat to, those folks oftentimes live in the leaf litter down there on the ground. In some cases, they lay larva or they overwinter as larva in the hollow stalks and stems of many of our old perennials that have died back to the ground. So if you clean all that up in the, in the fall and you drag that all off to your compost pile or worse yet, burn it or do something horrible that I'm sure none of you are doing because that's the worst thing you could do, um, you're actually sort of eliminating that whole regeneration of these really important insects that we need. So remember that you can see what it looked like in the winter and what it still looks like today and really we encourage you to let a lot of that stay in your garden as long as absolutely possible into the spring so what we're going to talk a bit about tonight is how we transition from the conventional landscape which is just a little picture here of kind of what you see when you drive around a lot of new neighborhoods these days how we move from that conventional landscape into what I consider um, nature scaping or really bringing these native plants into our world and how we do it differently than the picture that you're seeing here. I'm not sure there's anything in that picture that's native to begin with. Maybe there's a river birch in the background. The other thing that you might notice if you look at this, there's an awful lot of grass, which basically hosts nobody, but maybe Japanese beetle grubs, which is not what any of us want in our garden. And there's an awful lot of mulch and there's an, just an awful lot of empty space. And if I were a sweet little bird and I needed somewhere to hide from a hawk that might be swooping in to eat me, I'm not gonna have anywhere to hide. And if I'm a butterfly, I probably don't have a whole lot to nectar on, but maybe that purple cat mint, which blooms for a little while, but that's not a native plant. So it's not supporting all those layers of our uh, ecosystem and our diversity. So imagine if we leave that sort of landscape and now we move into what i call the conventional butterfly garden which now you're hearing about bee gardens a little bit i call this the budlia approach or the butterfly bush we've been through an era where we moved away from that very stark conventional landscape that you saw in the previous picture and we've started to add more things into our gardens and wow look at this now we've got all these butterflies and everybody feels like their job is done 
Well, you can see from this picture, the plant that's right there in the middle, that's our, our native purple coneflower, which by the way, some of you may be further afield from Virginia, but actually here in Virginia, purple coneflower is not native, grows well here, but it's a Midwest native. So even that, you could argue, is not even a plant that belongs here, potentially, depending on how you define native. But that is sort of the movement that we've gone from the conventional landscapes. Now we're doing these kinds of things, but we're still missing the mark, if you will, because we're still not providing the plants that are the food sources for insects, that are the, the nectar sources that are complex and are that come from our native plants. So take that old thinking. We had static landscapes. They're pretty much the same anywhere. That picture that I showed you, that could be Northern Virginia, that could be Maryland, that could be any number of places. It could be in the Midwest. Who knows where that place is? It's pretty much the same landscape year round. You got some evergreen, you got some deciduous trees that'll lose their leaves, but you got an awful lot of mulch and grass and that pretty much does the same thing year round. We put an awful lot of time into eliminating weeds. So anywhere that you have mulch or you don't have a native plant, you've got the potential for weeds, which is to some extent not creating any habitat, but creating an awful lot of work for us as gardeners. We also use an awful lot of industrial plants. And I'm sure many of you can think of what an industrial plant is. There's things that are pretty much indestructible, the things that they sell at Home Depot, Home Depot, some of you may know it as. Um, it's kind of the things that are just plop down in just about any landscape, just about anywhere. We have lots of lawn. We take care of that lawn endlessly all through the summer and therefore we have an awful lot of higher cost. It seems like it's pretty cut and dry. You just plop it in, do some mulching, you're okay. And oddly enough, when comparisons are done, there's a lot more higher cost to that and increased pollution. The amount of gas and pollution that we put out from using string trimmers and, and lawn mowers is, is worse uh, even than our cars oftentimes. Another thing that I see really frequently of most conventional landscapes is I see an awful lot of plants that got put in that are in the wrong place. So not only are they not native and potentially not supporting the complexities of biodiversity that we all really like, but we've also got plants that just outgrow their space and end up requiring even more work. And even if this were a plant that I might somehow want you know, half of it is pruned off and I get a lot of dye back and I get a lot of bloom that's missing. I mean, it's just like unpleasant. So not only is it not native, it's a little bit less pleasant than something we would want. So let's start thinking about how we can make our gardens dynamic rather than static. So I call that naturescaping. That is really when you look at your landscape, it's not just something that's aesthetic. It is aesthetic. It is the place that you might relax or the place you walk around and you enjoy, but it's also the place that's providing an awful lot of habitat. So we're sort of becoming that part of nature rather than apart from nature. So these are dynamic gardens. And what does that mean? That means they change all the time. We've got bloom that comes in and out all the time. We've got deciduous. We maybe we've got some evergreen. We have lots of layers, not mulch. Mulch, again, is just a place where a plant could go that's going to create a layer that is a lot more like what Mother Nature does out in the greater, you know, greater world. So because we plant this appropriately, we're protecting our water. We're using less water because the plants are building soil. They're holding the water. They're working better. And we're protecting our watershed. We're not losing soil. We're not um, you know, watching it erode away. And so therefore, it's actually doing more ecosystem services for us. And it, ultimately, we've got a lot more pollinators, a lot more butterflies, hummingbirds, you name it, more birds. I just think of that as more life. And I start to move away from just looking at the flowers on these native plants, which in and of themselves is beautiful. But I start to think of how the creatures that come to that, that enhanced livability adds more to my life than just looking at the flowers. So I look at this naturescaping as a way that I'm starting to become part of nature. And as we know, everything around us is being developed. I live in a really rural part of Virginia. Rappahannock County doesn't even have stoplights, none, not a single stoplight in my whole county. 
And yet I'm still watching things be developed here and native plants being lost. So it's really important that all of us, every time we can, make the choice to put plants back in our landscapes that are adding to our ecosystem as opposed to just being there to look pretty. So we're gonna create gardens that look more like this. You can see lots of layers. You can see lots of different textures. You can see lots of different sizes and shapes. We become certified wildlife habitats, if that's what you wish to you know, fill out the paperwork and go that route. But knowing that you're even doing that is what's making this all important. Um, and why should we even do this? I don't know if you can tell from this picture, because it's a little cloudy, but every tree down the side of the highway is a Bradford pear or a calorie pear. And you can go literally from, I don't know, where my mom lives down in Lynchburg, Virginia, and take Highway 29 all the way up past Charlottesville, past Madison, past Warrington, past Culpeper, all the way practically to Northern Virginia. And that tree has completely escaped cultivation and seeded out. So while I will hear people say, wow, that's really a pretty tree. It blooms white. I know that that is a very destructive plant that has taken over and displaced our native plants. It is not providing the same level of support to caterpillars and insects that our native plants will. And it's actually creating a huge problem. So the number one reason we want a nature scape, not really the number one reason, but the number one reason I'm gonna talk about right now is invasive species. We already looked at the calorie or Bradford pear in this picture on the right, we're looking at uh, Japanese red barberry. I went to school at Virginia Tech, I graduated from there. That is like the, the standard bearer <laughs> for Virginia Tech that it planted everywhere because it's kind of that purplish color. It makes me crazy that that is my alma mater and that plant is everywhere. It is very destructive and there's even been some research. I know Piedmont Environmental Council has presented some of this research uh, that because that barberry allows rodents more cover and those rodents are then not uh, picked off or eaten by hawks and other foxes or whatever because they have such great cover underneath all that prickly horrible shrub. That we're actually seeing in places or it's contributing to the increase in Lyme disease because the, that is the, the white-footed mouse is one of the, uh, the hosts that carry the Lyme. So in addition to being a plant that's displacing good natives, it's also an invasive. It's also adding to other ills, in this specific case, Lyme disease. The plant on the right, probably every one of you know what that is, that is English ivy. You have my absolute full permission to go out tomorrow when the weather is nice and start getting rid of your English ivy. <laughs> you can just cancel your subscription to the gym and go out there and pull that stuff up. I did have someone tell me recently that they had been mowing it with a heavy duty blade or using a weed eater with a heavy duty kind of blade or string and they stripped the leaves off of it a few times and actually it started dying back. So I know that that will work if you have an opportunity to do that, please, please do. And last but not least, we're gonna stop naming our roads after species that are invasive. One of the worst invasive plants where I live is autumn olive, which is a shrub that produces a berry late in the uh, late summer and into fall and it's uh birds will eat it it is because birds are opportunistic that time of year they're looking for food they're trying to find things that allow them to fatten up or to have a lot of good uh, uh, five, uh, uh, uh fats for winter and unfortunately the autumn olive berry is nothing but a bunch of sugar so it's actually doing them harm rather than helping them even though it's a food source I equate that to me eating maybe potato chips or candy every day, all day, which is not really going to give me good stuff to survive a cold winter or a migration to somewhere I have to go. So the next really big reason that we're going to do this is the insects. I've talked about this already. I know, again, if you listened to Doug Tallamy last week, you heard an awful lot about that. By the way, that little moth there is a Pandora sphinx moth. And the host plant for the Pandora sphinx moth is the... Uh, uh, Virginia creeper vine, and uh, just make a note of that. So these insects are providing an incredible array of ecosystem services for us, from pollination to breaking down organic matter to aerating soil, et cetera, et cetera. So they are all part of what I call that food web that you probably all heard about. 
These are insects, they're food for other creatures, again, aerating soil, pollinating, and ultimately sustaining human health. And that's why the native plants are so important as opposed to plants that come from somewhere else. Native being a plant that is from this part of the world that occurs here naturally, not something that was introduced from another part of the world. So plants generally that are native to this area are plants that were here before colonization of Europeans. Because once Europeans really started moving around the world, plants started moving with them. So these would have been plants that were here before that time. And that's what we consider native. And you can define native as native to my state or my region or what, but it is still the plants that really belong there. Another important reason that we're gonna talk about these natives and why they're so important is a quote from Doug that maybe you heard this last week again. 85% of the land in, in the United States is privately owned. So if we as landowners are not taking the opportunity to use native plants and to create more ecosystem right in our backyard, then it's not gonna happen. Maybe they're gonna do it in a conservation planting uh, at a park somewhere, or, or maybe they're gonna have it you know, around a, 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 you know, a garden at some, that Girl Scouts do at a park or whatever, but really it is up to us to sort of make changes in the world. Uh, here in the picture, I do want to talk some, about something really fun. This is the native coral honeysuckle vine. It's a lovely vine. It's related to honeysuckle. It's the native re relation to the Japanese honeysuckle, which is a terrible invasive, as many of us know. It'll pull your fence, fence row down. But I have a native honeysuckle vine out my kitchen window crawling up a fence railing up to our deck. And this is blooming in the spring, and that's when they bloom. It is a hummingbird magnet. You will also see some butterflies come and nectar on it with their long proboscis or little tongue. They can get down into those flowers. So my husband, who is my partner in life, but also in the business, he is known as Mr. Infrastructure. He looked out the window doing the dishes one day and said, wow, there are some really cool birds in the native honeysuckle vine. And I, of course, being smart aleck and know it all that I am, I said, oh, it's a, it's a hummingbird, honey. That's a hummingbird vine. And he said, I might be Mr. Infrastructure, but I'm not stupid. That is no hummingbird. And so oddly enough, I came around and I took a look at what was happening and I got out my little bird book because I didn't know what those birds were either. And it turns out that they are Cape May warblers. There were two pair of Cape May warblers eating the aphids off of my honeysuckle vine. So sometimes the relationships and the, the food web and the complexity of this interaction between our native plants and the creatures that we love and that we share our world with is a lot more deep and complex than we ever iman uh, imagined it to be. And you can see on their bills from these pictures that I'm showing you, you can see the little aphids all over their bills. And you can look down below this male warbler, Cape May warbler, and see the flowers down below there. And you can see the aphids, that vine, is prone to getting aphids early in the spring because it grows really quickly and fast in the spring and aphids love that quick green, quick growth. And so it tends to get those aphids. So I am reminded about the relationships in the food web beyond the ones that I even think that I know about or that I recognize. And this is a great example. So don't spray any chemicals. So anyway, moving on. Let's so go out there and let's create some dynamic landscapes. We are going to really talk about some plants now. I took the time to put a label as we go through of the common and Latin name here so that it will at least help you orient and, and maybe if you're taking notes, be able to uh, take a quick notes so that that will um, give you a little bit of information. And I know you can go back and watch the lecture later and, and that may help you uh, remember those plants. So we're going to talk about five plus ways that you can get natives into your landscape. As we go through this, here are the things that I want you to remember. Why is naturescaping and why are these dynamic landscapes different from this conventional landscape that's all around us? Okay, so here are things to remember. You wanna think in layers. You don't just want a tree or shrubs with mulch under them. That is not layering. You want to think about height, you know, altitude diversity. So think about, you know, high, medium, low, ground cover kind of thing. So you're gonna think in layers that gives you altitude diversity. 
You want variation in bloom time. So flowers that are blooming as long as possible through the season. That's what we call temporal diversity. So you have a lot of diversity over time. You want to include lots of different kinds of flowers. Uh, if you look on the left here, we have some flower heads of oak leaf hydrangea and also that red plant that flower is uh, bee balm. Again, another hummingbird magnet. Oh, I just realized I didn't label that slide. Too many, too many plants to label. Anyway, that red flower is bee balm. It's a Monarda uh, hummingbird uh, nectar source. Um, that is one type of flower, you know, deep throated flowers designed for butterflies and hummingbirds, for example. And then if you look to the right and you see the flowers that are white there in the garden that are sort of the tall ones, that is more of a, a, a composite or a, a flower that's designed for more short tongued or medium tongued bees and pollinators. So those are different types of flowers that attract a whole different range of insects. So we think of that as being species diversity. So you have height diversity or altitude diversity, you've got temporal diversity with bloom time and you've got species diversity. So all different kinds of flowers. You want to think about planting in masses or in groups, not a single plant. Unless that is a plant that really spreads well, in which case ask the person you're buying it from. And ultimately you want to create a framework of grasses and sedges in these gardens. I think of sedges, which are the cool season equivalent to grasses uh, as the underappreciated, underutilized and unknown native plant world. And they are really important components of our, of our ecosystems. So what's one way that you can get native plants? Well, you can start from scratch and I'm just gonna show you a little bit of a fun project that we uh, designed and worked with the owner here in the picture, that's Victor. He is the owner of the Vienna Vintner in Vienna, Virginia. You can drive right down 123, Vienna, Virginia and go right by here and see this as a finished product. And he had a conventional landscape design that was proposed to him and some folks came along, uh, a group called Restore Nature, and they said, we would really like you to use native plants. And he was game for it. I redid the design. And uh, this was the kind of thing that existed on Church Street, downtown Vienna, that conventional cruddy landscape that we all look at all the time. We had volunteers that come in, we planted this in the fall. And this is what it looks like literally the following summer. So six, eight months later, this was the landscape. The one thing I don't like about Zoom, I'm gonna admit right now, is that I love when I get to show pictures like this and everybody goes, oh, cool, I love that. <laughs> I can't hear any of you. Anyway, I know I'm feeling in my bones that you're all you know, excited about this kind of a garden. So this is now a showstopper garden. He does go out and piddle with it. He loves to be in his garden early in the morning before the wine shop is open. He plays with it. We've got sedges in this garden. We have a range of diversity, a range of heights as we can, because this is a commercial space. We couldn't have giant tall things in there. We didn't want trees there. He wants people to see his building from the road. But we did you know, pay attention to the diversity that is needed in a, in a garden like this. Another way, moving on, that you can incorporate more native plants. These are questions that I get for, from people all the time is what can I plant in that little area called the Hell Strip? It's that little dead zone there between the road and the sidewalk. And Hell Strips kind of occur in different places. And they're usually, you know, sometimes it might even be a rock garden. Uh, often it's really hard packed soil, maybe things of cars or whatnot have been driving on that soil. There's no fertility typically. It's, um, it can be in the sun, can be in the shade. If there's street trees shading out the area, it's even a bigger problem because not only do you have dry, but you got shade. And I get this question from customers and clients all the time. So what's gonna grow there? That's like the one place I can't get a native plant to grow. I'm sure nothing will grow there. Well, actually lots of things will grow there. And here's a little project that a, a volunteer who comes to the nursery, uh, Sandy, and she had a, really an area where grass didn't want to grow. She wanted to get rid of grass as much as possible anyway. She said, I got this sort of thing and I think it's what you call a hell strip because I can't get anything to grow there. So she reclaimed that by laying down some newspaper and throwing some mulch on it, letting it sit for a few months. And then we went in with a handful of plants, specifically uh, a lyre leaf sage, salvia lorata, purple knockout, has a very purple foliage there in the, in the middle foreground of the picture. 
real thread leaf plant, Coreopsis verticillata zagra, that is a cultivar. Both of those are cultivars, in fact. Uh, that is thread leaf tick seed. And then lastly, we put in some beard tongue or penstem and digitalis husker red, which is there in the bottom left hand part of your, your corner is that plant. And these are really right after they went in and she threw in some mulch because we designed this knowing that these plants were really gonna spread and dance around. So literally within a handful of months, the picture on the left is what she had. And then a year later, she's got a huge amount of spread from her yellow flowering uh, coreopsis, tick seed coreopsis. So even that minor little step with an appropriate choice of plants gave her this incredible diversity and range of bloom times from May, late April, May, the beard tongue with the white there flowering well into June. And then you get into the lyre leaf sage flowers and then also the foliage color. And then you go into the coreopsis, which the yellow coreopsis tick seed, which continues to bloom really throughout the summer and into fall. She's adding other plants in another part of her yard that will pick up the flower uh, uh, season, you know, late summer and going into fall. But this is what she did to tame an area of her yard that wasn't growing anything. Now, one thing I'm going to say, I'm going to see if I can back up the slide. There we go. I get frequently asked about cultivars. So I'm gonna just answer that question right now. There's a little bit of a confusion with people uh, over the word native R versus the word cultivar. I don't like the word native R. I am actually a horticulturalist. It's my degree and all plants are native to somewhere. So if you have a selection or a plant that's been selected for certain characteristics and it's, it's a cultivar name, that's the single quotes. In this case, Salvia lorata, purple knockout. The purple knockout is the cultivar of the Salvia lorata. It just exhibits specific characteristics from the, different from the species. In this case, purplish leaves. That cultivar, that, na that plant is native to somewhere. So it's a cultivar. People are referring to native plants as native ours because they're cultivars potentially, but that's only because the plant is native to here. If I'm in China with a Chinese plant, I guess that would be a native R there if it's a native to them. So I just just stay away, I just stay away from personally, stay away from the word native art. They're they're cultivars. That's the horticulturally technical term that's appropriate to use. In this case, we chose certain cultivars mainly because of their attributes. Uh, and I have grown all of these long enough to feel comfortable in their ability to support insects um, and pollinators in the ecosystem. All of these uh, cultivars are selecting for some kind of characteristics. So in some cases, when you start to really change bloom color, and especially if you change the formation of a flower, like it goes from being a single flower to like super double flowering with lots of petals, you oftentimes are sacrificing the volume of nectar or the quality of the nectar or the pollen. So we're very careful at Hill House Nursery about the cultivars that we do grow. Many of the ones that we grow are actually grown from seed, which I know allows genetic diversity for those plants, which makes me feel better about them. And because we've grown them for a while and we've seen how they respond or how they support Pollinators, we feel more comfortable about offering that, but that's not true at all cultivars. So just be advised. I am not a person that says no cultivars are useful. That would not be the case. Uh, this is another great health strip plant. I do want to show you. This is known, uh, this is pussy toes or field pussy toes. This one grows in really hot, dry places. It's a little carpeting plant. It's kind of that silvery color. A friend of mine has it spilling out of her little ceramic uh, pot there and it, this is actually on the slope and it sort of curves down and wraps around the rocks. This is a great little ground cover that gets adorable little flowers. Whoops, up oh, the picture's going to show up later. The flower, adorable little pussy toe, little cat foot, little silvery white flowers later on. So that's a really nice one for, uh, it's sort of like a little ground cover in really dry places. So when we talk about hell strips, it's a little bit akin to slopes. They have some similar characteristics as slopes, and, as slopes do and tend to be dry, sometimes sun, sometimes shade, tend to be places where plants don't grow really well, very much like the hellstrip. So I like to share with you a handful of plants that are really good for planting slopes. 
And although on this picture, this is not a very steep slope, the one with the sidewalk, it is in fact a great plant and we use it frequently on steeper slopes. And this is the, the low growing or the dwarf form of our native uh, fragrant sumac. So this is Russ Aromatica Grolo. The picture on the left is the fall color. It is absolutely beautiful and spectacular and very eye-catching. It's always nice that a native plant can have a really eye-catching aesthetic because you know and I know that we're doing all these great sort of biodiversity ecosystem services and we're you know maybe supporting habitat. But when we can get other people to see it and say, wow, what is that? Then we maybe you're getting a convert to planting more of the kinds of plants that'll help save the world, if you will. So this is one that's really fun on slopes. It's really, really pretty. It grows maybe two or three feet tall max. It's sheer here. This is at the Irvine Nature Center, by the way, up in Owings Mills, Maryland, um, where that planting is down on either side of the sidewalk. They have great, really great native plantings all around their, their, um, their science center. And uh, this is one that they shear it every so many years and otherwise they let it go. I have successfully used this on a lot of really steep slopes to uh, um, great effect. It, it's it, the branches, it sort of roots along the branches which help it really kind of hold soil in place. Now just for kicks, this is the straight species of that same Russ aromatica, the sumac. This is the fragrant sumac in all of its glory. Um, this is at a planting in Northern Fauquier County at the Northern Fauquier Park. And it's uh, about four to five feet tall. And they have a big mass of them right around the little uh, parking lot sort of sidewalk area. On the right is a close up of it. You can see the little, the little catkins starting to come out. Uh, that's sort of the early bloom. Again, this gets that really pretty orangish red fall color, but it's a much bigger sort of more upright plant. The, the low grow is a very low one that stays down low and roots along the stems, whereas the taller cousin, the big sieve, I like to call it, uh, is actually more of an upright, <clears throat> excuse me, upright shrub. So you can use either of those if you really need a straight species and you need something taller, you're still gonna get those good, these are good early pollinator uh, pollen plants. Let me get a drink there, all this talking, I'm having such a good time. Another great plant that I use all the time on dry slopes, especially full sun to light shade. And this is the aromatic aster. It is a really pretty late bloomer, um, maybe September, October into November, if you use the cultivar on the left, Ray Don's favorite with the monarch. That's my daughter's little hand sticking in there. Back in her day, she was you know, chasing butterflies. Now she's a horse girl, she chases horses. But anyway, this is the aromatic aster. It's a very dense branching aster. And if you look at the picture, especially on the right there with a little bit closer, you can see that some of the centers of the flowers in the center of the, the purple rays are yellow and some of them are red. And this is typical of asters. When, you, when, the, when the flower has not been pollinated, has not been visited yet, it has that real yellow color. Once it starts to be visited by the bees and the pollen declines because it's been pollinated, it'll turn more of that reddish purple color. So it kind of adds this interesting dynamic that you know your plant is doing something really exciting because you can see it right there. Uh, who's been, what flowers have been visited? These are pretty long flowering species, this aromatic aster. Again, that Raiden's favorite. I've seen that flowering as late as Thanksgiving uh, when we have kind of mild fall. So it's one of the latest nectar sources for our monarch butterflies specifically as they start migrating back towards Mexico. They need the milkweed plants, of course, early in the season to lay their eggs because their caterpillars only eat milkweed. But they need nectar plants the rest of the time because that's what the adults need. Other plants, when you go start going to slopes, you want to start thinking about what is really holding uh, holding your soil in place. And this was at the Piedmont Environmental Council uh, main office in Warrington. We did big planting there. We've got different kinds of grasses and we've got the, the uh, I wish I had a pointer so I could show y'all what I'm talking about. We used a lot of that astro on this hillside in addition to some grasses up near the top that I'm going to show you here in just a second. And this is one of those grasses. This is purple love grass. This is the seed head or the bloom, quote unquote, sort of that pink mauve color. This grass will grow in the 
side of the gravel. I mean, you can just literally plant it almost anywhere, full sun, hot, dry. So it would work in the hell strip. It works in a regular garden and it certainly works on steep slopes. And here is a great example of a customer who came and bought a whole bunch of plug trays. Uh, this is her little Japanese tea house. It's really beautiful setting. She planted all these uh, purple love grasses and that's what it looks like when it flowers. It is really just a cloud of pink. Uh, and she's just letting it go to seed and fill in. And so this is a really useful plant when you, you can underplant other perennials with it. It's only about a foot, foot and a half tall, those plumes. Uh, you mow it off later on in the season if you want. Half the time, I don't ever get in any of those chores done in my garden. So if you don't get those chores done, don't worry about it. Some other native plants for slopes, I just wanna make a quick mention of. We've got a sedge up in the top left corner. I took that picture in the dead of winter. You can still see how green it is. That one's a little more of a two foot tall, that Cherokee sedge. Really bigger, more robust sedge than some of our smaller ones. The center photo is the bottle brush buckeye. I use bottle brush buckeye uh, along with the low grow aromatic sumac with the orange uh, uh, fall color that I showed you a few minutes ago. I use those together in a steep slope planting and it was really pretty stunning. The nice thing about bottle brush buckeye is it blooms literally in June into July. And so many pollinators, insects, butterflies, you name it, butter, hummingbirds, so many of them are showing up to that plant. It sounds like it's gonna take off and fly. It's just alive with life. And I gotta tell you, as pretty as the flowers are, it's even better just to be able to see the insects that come to it. It's just amazing. Uh, another little shrub that's not very well known, I wanted to give a mention to it, this is bush honeysuckle. This is truly a shrub in the honeysuckle family, but it is not a, a Lanicera, it's actually Dyer Villa. It is not these invasive shrub honeysuckles that are all over the place. This is truly a native, it has little yellow clusters of flowers at each branch where the leaves at each bract where the leaves come out. And uh, again, bumblebees really just adore that. It blooms all through the summer. And some things across the bottom are a little bit smaller. We've got moss phlox, phlox subulata. And I'm showing you that picture because that's a great one for slopes. If you look where the red clay is on the left versus the black or mulchy stuff on the right around those plants, it rained like a gully washer. And where the plants were, it held the soil in place, even though they hadn't spread very much. Where there weren't any plants on the left there or near those rocks, soil just kind of washed out. That plant is doing its job. It's also a great nectar source when it flowers. So you've got soil protection, you've got pollinator offerings, it's a little bit of a multi-purpose kind of plant. Sensitive fern is a nice one for shady slopes, believe it or not, that is a very steep bank, about four to five feet tall, and that sensitive fern is just flat, just, just spreading all down through there. And a similar shade plant for steep slopes would be the white wood aster, which has a, a sort of semi-evergreen leaves through the winter, and then these stalks uh, just sort of hang out in the winter, and then come a summer, they green up, send up new shoots, and then flower late summer and into fall. It's a really nice spreader. An all right, I love this picture. I'm so sad I can't hear all of y'all laughing. I always show this and I go, another way to get natives in your yard is to connect the dots. So I'm hoping that all of you are snickering to yourselves going, yep, do you see the two giant dots in that yard? <laughs> Imagine if that were a larger bed filled with plants. What could you put in there? What could you do to have less grass? Well, first of all, I wanna talk about trees because we had two big giant ones there. And I'm gonna take the opportunity to talk about a couple of trees. I get asked a lot about screening and about trees. A couple of less well-known. You might know what a loblolly pine is because they plant them three or four feet apart and then cut them for lumber or pulp or whatever. When you plant them further apart, they are beautiful, soft, lovely trees. That is at my house on the left. I love and adore those trees. So I highly recommend that when you need to get evergreen in, that is an option. On the right, I've got a little mixture of trees. Uh, in the background on the left is a Virginia red cedar. And on the right is the American holly. And in the foreground, that deciduous tree is a scarlet oak. So think about rather than having a single tree somewhere, if you can do a mixture again of deciduous, or and evergreen and even textures 
you've suddenly got, you know, sort of upper story canopy and you can add layers of diversity just by choosing to do a little mixture. And it doesn't have to be a hundred trees. It doesn't have to be 15 of each species, even those three right there next to the trampoline that nobody uses anymore in my front yard. Even those three create this really nice nook and the birds are in there all the time. Virginia red cedar hosts something like 56 different songbirds because they eat the seeds and the, the berries rather. And then the holly is the same thing. Holly, you know, has a lot of holly berries. It's really important to, to our bird species through the winter. So some other coming down in the canopy, some other trees that we might include. This is the sourwood blooming in the summer on the left. Fall color, you can see the bracts that are left on the right. This is a tree in the Ericaceae or the blueberry family. Stunning all of the year. It's one of my favorite trees, can be a little challenging to grow in heavy clay. It prefers to have a little bit of uh, compost that you scrape up out of the woods, worked into the soil. Uh, and that tree was much more successful uh, growing that way. Another less well-known one that will grow in full sun, will also grow under the shade of oak trees. It will grow in very dry sites. This is the hop hornbeam, Australia virginiana. These are planted right in front of the Rappahannock County Public Library. If you're ever in our neck of the woods, drive by and see them. They're a really stunning tree. They have cool little hops, little, little seed structures, if you will, bloom structures. Really tough, durable trees. This is the kind of tree that you're gonna put in the yard if you don't have a lot of space or if you need to underplant and sort of bring down the canopy or you have a really dry site. Another one, speaking of dwarf or understory trees, this is a dwarf chestnut oak. For those of you, again, who heard about oaks from Dr. Talamy being a keystone species because of the number of insects and the Lepidoptera, which are moths and butterflies, the number that they support. This is a great dwarf oak that might work for many of us who don't have the space for a big, giant, white or red oak, but need an oak species nevertheless. And this is a, a dwarf one that does maybe 12 feet. It acorns very early and it is still an oak uh, support system to all those uh, moths and butterflies. So I, we really are excited to be growing this one. Uh, here's one, this is a forest pansy redbud. Again, this is a cultivar. And the reason I wanna show you this, I love redbuds. People think of them as kind of common, maybe, because they're sort of just around. They are incredible nectar sources early in the spring. So do not discount the importance of that in terms of early nectar for our pollinators. The reason I want to show you this one is this one has purple leaves, which people really like, and it is very pretty. But the problem with purple leaves, when we think about our leaf-eating insects, is that they are... The, that leaf itself is heavy or rich in anthocyanins, which gives it that red or purple color, which means it's not really the same leaf in terms of its nutrition as a green leaf, which is full of, you know, full of different compounds, not as heavy to anthocyanins. So we find that insects maybe eat less of those redder leaves. So I just want to caution you, that is a pretty plant used sparingly, but Remember to have lots of other non-purple leaves in your landscape so that there's still plenty of things for leaf eating in, uh, insects to eat. So stepping down into the shrub layer, this is one of my favorites. This is nine bark flowering on the left, up close of the seed heads, which are after, that is not a bud getting ready to open. That is actually the seed head after the flowers are finishing. And it stays that really pinkish red color all through the summer. It is really a stunning shrub. Pretty big, multi-stem shrub, can be six, seven feet, eight feet even, so you want to give it some room, but it is a really delightful shrub to have in your, in your connect the dots spaces. A couple of other ones are the clethras or the sweet pepper bush, the summer sweets. The straight species is on the, <clears throat> excuse me, is on the left. That's that white flowering with the swallowtail butterfly. And the shrub on the right is a cultivar called ruby spice. Again, this is one that we've grown for many years. We've watched the insect activity on that ruby spice, despite the fact that it has a, a red or pink flower rather than white. And we, we are seeing uh, still a great deal, if not equal amount of pollinator activity on it. So we, we're feeling pretty comfortable with, the, with these ecosystem support from that shrub. They both are incredibly fragrant, flowering in July. What could be better than a really cool native shrub 
that doesn't look so bad the rest of the year. Whoops, I'm going to show you a picture of it in a minute. I thought it was the next slide. Uh, but that is what you're going to get in the summertime. It's fragrant, full of pollinators. It's a nice, upright, rounded shrub. It's just a really lovely uh, addition to your garden. A few other options I'm gonna show you here on the very left is the winterberry. Uh, I think that's probably a dwarf cultivar. I didn't have it labeled, so I wasn't sure. Uh, red twig dogwood or cornus sericea over there on the right. Those are two really nice winter interest adding food sources to your garden. The berries there on the left are eaten by birds later in winter after they've been frozen and thawed for a while. Whereas the dogwood and the maple leaf viburnum there blooming in the center, those are both species that set berries or clusters of berries or droops that birds really eat earlier in the season. They're a little more sugary. So they tend to eat those, the, the, the dogwood berries earlier in the season. Whereas the maple leaf viburnum, they eat those in the fall and they eat the winter berry uh, berries in the winter. Maybe that's why you see those berries in the winter. So they call it winter berry and then the birds are eating it in the winter. Maybe that's the way to remember it. So all these are great understory or low, lower canopy plants that can be used uh, to add more bird food. Up oh, here's the shrub I want, uh, slide I wanted to show you. I took these today. On the left is winterberry. Right now, today, those little brown little circles there, that's, those are the last few berries. My shrub was absolutely loaded with berries uh, all fall and into winter. And once we had a lot of cold weather, freezing and thawing, I watched birds really come in and start eating those berries. They've stripped the shrubs now. Uh, likewise, on the right is the summer sweet or the clethra that I showed you a few minutes ago. And that's what it looks like in the winter. It's got a lot of really interesting seed heads from the flowers. It has a very aesthetic kind of nice look to it, even in the winter. So I just wanted to tell you that a lot of these things, we talk about what they look like in flowering or they, what they might have for fall color, but they actually have quite a bit of interest even in the winter and a lot of maybe little hiding places. Uh, one of the evergreens we use a lot um, because people are looking for evergreens a lot and that is uh, inkberry. There's a cultivar on the left called shamrock. It's really dense. Uh, there's a straight species in the center that I took at the Fauquier, Northern Fauquier Park. And then my inkberry, which is growing in absolute full shade next to my deck on the right. So you can see what happens Cultivar is the most dense of the species. Uh, the straight species in full sun looks great. The straight species in shade opens up and gets more loose. So it's kind of interesting to know that plants will often go from sun to shade, but it changes their structure. Now, inkberry has male and female. All of the cultivars in the market are female. So if you want to get the little black berries that are a food source to birds, you're going to have to find a, a male, not available in the regular trade. You really got to come to a, a native plant grower who's growing them to get a male shrub. So you get those berries set. So when you're moving down, you're going from the canopy, you're thinking about layers, you're going into places where you're gonna add all these different layers. You're now, we're, we're stepping down into the herbaceous layer. So here we've got some ferns, Eastern wood fern, and then in the very top corner there to the right uh, below these uh, river birch, we get into some aromatic aster. So just wanted to show you what this starts to look like when you bring it all together. And here's the kind of plants that we're talking about when we get into the herbaceous layer. I'm going to point out some of these as we get going. So we're going to jump through here. So now that we're down to that herbaceous or sedge layer, I want to talk about underplanting. Why have mulch when you can come in with sedges and other things? So here is mountain sedge, which loves and grows very well in dry shade. Here's another photograph of it. This is in Charlottesville at Boar's Head Inn. This is, a, there's, this is a deck with an overhang and those sedges are growing underneath the overhang. No rain even hits them, but they're growing just fine. And this is the dead of winter when we took this photograph. So these are ways that you backdrop things or plant in really dry areas and using a native plant that is useful in those places. And, you know, I, I just imagine all the little pupa and insects or whatever that are hiding, you know, down underneath there living out their winter protected because of those sedges. Uh, we looked at the white wood aster earlier. It's another great one for drier sites. On the left, you can see uh, the, the leaves in the dead of winter. I had a client years ago that absolutely had to have everything cleaned up, had to, they had, he had customers, or had uh, 
garden guys come in and cut down all the stems and all the seed beds. Do not do that. <laughs> that's what it looks like, but I'm just looking at that, thinking about all the soil that's washing away in the winter. Uh, and there again is the flower on the right. We did look at this one a little bit earlier, but I wanted to mention it as a great one for drier sites. And again, we mentioned the sedge, the mountain sedge. Another one is Pennsylvania sedge. You can see in this picture the difference. The mountain sedge on the left is more of a clumper, very fine foliage. The, the, the Pennsylvania sedge on the right is more of a spreading, carpeting kind of sedge. And it tends to not be so upright. It tends to be soft and flowing. We, we use those on slopes a lot of times. Loves oak hickory kind of setting. So if you got oak hickory trees and any of those complex of plants, that's your sedge. Here's a nice combination of a skull cap, a native scutellaria, likes really dry shade interplanted with another sedge called bristle leaf sedge. And this again is how you can sort of add diversity. You don't need one or the other, you can do both and have that plant mix in a dry shade spot as an underplanting. While we're talking about the sedges, I have what I call the wide guys. We've looked at several of them already that are very narrow leaves, but these sedges have very wide leaves the blue wood or blue satin sedge on the right and the, and the seersucker sedge on the left, you can see the seed heads coming up on that sedge. They're beautiful. These are evergreen, stick around in the garden all year. This is an indigo bunting eating the seed heads from a seersucker sedge. So I hear people say a lot, they don't really like sedges and grasses. We don't really, you know, we're not really keen on them. And I keep thinking they are a food source for birds primarily and other small rodents maybe, but definitely birds in the spring because they are cool season. So they're flowering very soon and setting seeds very soon. So before birds are eating any other kinds of seeds and even before a lot of insects are out and before they're nesting, this is one of their food sources. I took this picture out of clients, indigo bunting. She called me and said, I have a blue bird eating my sedges. And I said, that's a blue bird, but that's an indigo bunting, lucky you. Anyway, I mentioned pussy toes earlier. Here's another photograph of it with the flowers there on the right. And then it, uh, I've got a picture of the caterpillar for the American lady butterfly. That's the larva. And this is the host plant for that. So in addition to solving some of your problems, you are also providing a food source for the larva. And another one we're here on uh, wild ginger, uh, a serum. This is another great ground cover down at that herbaceous layer. And I believe I have Christmas fern, another dry shade evergreen. And you can put those two things together and you've got fern and ginger, which is not evergreen, but you just have this love, lovely soft mix. So you can do your layering, not just from big, tall things down to medium and low things, but to actually herbaceous low things to even lower ground cover things. So those are two great choices there. So if you've got more moist soils, you might move to something more like woodland phlox or golden ragwort, Pacora aria in the center there and Jacob's Ladder. Those are beautiful things that are coming out here soon in the spring. Fragrant, indestructible plants. This is the golden ragwort in the winter. I took this picture actually in the winter. They are very evergreen at the crown. Incidentally, they grow under walnuts where many other plants don't grow. Again, this is the yellow plant here in the center. This is the crown. And they also don't, deer don't eat them. So what could be better? Grows under walnuts, flowers, basically evergreen at the base and deer don't eat them. I think we should all have a ton of that in our garden. So then I have the winter berry I showed you earlier. Here's a shot of down underneath and the plants that we've been talking about are all coming up underneath there because a lot of our shrubs, you know, they, the, the way they grow, there's all this room underneath where you could bring plants in. So a lot of the plants we're talking about would go right into that layer. So here are a few other ways. We've been over five big ways to add natives. So a few other ways, how can I keep adding those layers? By mowing less grass, connecting my dots, planting my house strip, expanding a bed. How can I create additional habitat? I can, again, mow less grass. Have I said that enough times already? Uh, can you plant or maintain a meadow even at the smallest scale? Here in this picture, a friend of mine, when she lived in a townhouse, that was, you know, literally the sidewalk is just, you know, two feet out of the picture. Uh, and so this was her little native plant garden right there in front of her townhouse. So um, can you capture the, that space and do something really powerful with it? Uh, can, you catch, can you plant something at the base of your downspout or where your air conditioner drips out and use that water? 
And finally, you really want to not burn things. You want to pile your printings. You want to hang on to all those good materials. Uh, so here's a place where we added a little meadow. This is in Charlottesville. Teeny little postage stamp yard on either side of her sidewalk. She had her garden in the foreground uh, on, towards us. And then my staff are back there planting that whole other piece of grass. She said, I do not want grass. So we came in and we planted that in the late winter, early spring. And this was the first summer. Again, paying attention to uh, diversity of flower structures and types, bloom time diversity. We've got sedges in there. We got plants that grow really easily on the hot, dry edge because her driveway is just out of the picture on the left and the sidewalk is just in the little foreground. You can see the little corner that there with the sedge hanging over right up to her steps. Totally got rid of all that grass. She couldn't be happier. So uh, when you go back and look at the slide in the review, uh, 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 you can read all the names of those plants, but that'll give you a sense of the kinds of things that come together. Uh, another way to make a mini meadow is to just take a whole strip of ground and say, I'm going to give it over to a combination of plants that just really work well together. And this is at Shenandoah University up in Winchester. And this is brown-eyed Susans, Rebecca Trilova. You can see them flowering there in the yellow. And dwarf switchgrass, Shenandoah is the cultivar. Of course, it's Shenandoah University. Uh, of course, they would have that, that switchgrass there. It's got a lot of red tones. Those two plants together, they seed out. They spread out, they run between the sidewalk and Abrams Creek, which is back over to the left behind. And that's all there is. They go through once a year and they mow it down and leave the prunings there and it just all grows back up. It is absolutely a stunning uh, area. Two other really great combinations would be short tooth mountain mint, which is the number one pollinator plant. We consider it has the longest bloom time, attracts the greatest diversity of insects, and has the most repeat visits by any single insect. Rather than leaving it and going somewhere else, they stay right there. So we think of those mountain mint, that pygnanthemum family or genus as a really, really great group of plants. You marry that with a northern sea oats, the two of them spread and reseed. You can almost repeat what we saw in the previous slide with these two species as well. You can marry Amsonia. Again, more of the taller grass-like plant, but it's a flowering perennial with a native perennial petunia, Ruellia. You've got the short down underneath with the petunia. You've got the taller upright early flowering species from the Amsonia and they just dance around together and spread and just eat up a whole section of ground. Um, other grasses that we like to use for that are switchgrass. This is a north wind cultivar, very upright. Get rid of the miscanthus that everybody's got the non-native grasses and the pampas grass, get rid of those and use the switchgrass or the Indian grass. You'll get a lovely native grass that's in and of themselves host plants for certain Lepidoptera and also uh, overwintering sites. Uh, this is my mother saying, take some of her Black Eyed Susan. So if any of you guys wanna repeat this, you can just go on down to her house. She's got lots of it. <laughs> I like to show that. She's like, here, take them. So there you go. Um, these are some other Rudbeckia species that we really like. And the one in the foreground there in front of me is the green-headed coneflower. Really tall species, gets about four to five feet tall, loves wet ground, can tolerate shade, but it absolutely will attract wasps and another hymenoptera, bees, ants, wasps, so wasps and bees that you will never see on another species. That, that particular green-headed coneflower is, is just a magnet for some really cool stuff. Uh, and of course, any of the DYCs, the darn yellow composites, those are the Heliopsis and Helianthes, those are the perennial sunflowers. There's lots of different species for your conditions. Those are other powerhouse flowering plants in the height of summer that really, really bring in the pollinators and feed them well. And one other group of uh, combinations I want to mention is the narrow leaf mountain mint there to the right. And the, for whatever reason, the very blurry picture, I can't explain that on the left is the hyssop leaf thoroughwort. The mountain mint is a summer bloomer. You get that really, you can see the butterflies. You can get that really powerhouse plant going. And about the time that fades, the hyssop leaf thoroughwort on the left is the plant that comes in behind that and continues that same flower type for another two or three months for, for all the pollinators to come and nectar on. Uh, another really fun one I want to mention, we're getting down to the wire here. I know we've been going almost an hour. So 
This is the uh, rattlesnake master. You can see it on the left. You can see the flowers all the way up at the top near that yellow bulb. I'm embarrassed to say that's my back porch. I should have like put a globe over that before I took the picture. Uh, around the base of the rattlesnake master is some blue lobelia. And hiding in this pot on my back porch is that little tree frog there in the right hand from photo. So you are creating diversity and habitat even in the littlest ways when you create these kind of dynamic gardens and marry them. So don't forget all the little spaces. I know uh, we all understand, I hope all of us understand about butterflies uh, or monarch butterflies needing milkweed to be their host plant. Don't forget, this is one for really open drier areas, very short, the orange butterfly will be. More useful one that we find is the swamp milkweed. Uh, it doesn't have to have swamp, can tolerate moisture conditions, but it really does pretty well in a, a regular garden setting. And it's a clumper, a little tall, tends to be a little more garden friendly, we find. And last but not least, I'm getting down to the last slides here. The reason that we're doing this, we're doing this for the next generation. We're doing it because our world is pretty impaired in a lot of ways, and we are empowered to make these kinds of choices and pull these kind of plants in our garden and create you know, this, just this incredible running di ecosystem diversity that we are a part of so that our children will then grow up with the things that maybe some of us grew up with that are now gone. Um, there's a lot of talk about how you could drive your car at night, you don't hit the same number of moths as you used to because they're not there anymore. There are places that don't have lightning bugs anymore because we don't have the same kind of ecosystem. We don't have the same habitat there anymore. So I, that is my daughter when she was four. She's now almost 16. That's not what she looks like anymore. She'll be embarrassed to know that I put this picture in here. But I wanna make sure that she's gonna to get to see the stuff that I grew up with and all of you and your children and grandchildren. By the way, that flower there on the right, that is white turtle head. I'm sorry, I didn't label that one now that I realize it. That is the host plant, by the way, of the Baltimore checker spot butterfly, which is a rather rare and endangered butterfly. So. Um, I know we're going to get some questions. There may be already some there. This is my mailbox. If you're, you know, just driving down every road in the world, if you see 631, come on up and visit us. Um, I just want to say with, with much, much, much gratitude from the bottom of my heart and from the palette in my nursery. I saw this today, took that picture. Uh, I'm going to wrap up here and we're going to, I'm going to turn it over to Margaret or whoever's going to facilitate questions. And I'll see if I can spend a little bit of time uh, after I drink something, answering any questions. So do I need to take out my screen? That's what I'm thinking. Uh, you can or whatever you prefer. Thanks, Janet. That was wonderful. I mean, clearly, there is no shortage of wonderful native plants for anyone who wants beauty in their yard. It shouldn't be any kind of problem. Right, no shortage at all. <laughs> We've been trying in the background to pick out the questions that have the most general interest and Nicole is going to present them to you. We tried to answer other questions as best we could um, directly to people, uh, but I know there are some even more specific questions. And I would think that for those, for some of those, what people would wanna do is, is call their native plant nursery and ask them <laughs> about that. If you live anywhere near Warrington, you could call Janet and I'm sure she could tell you. Yeah. Uh, we'll turn it over to Nicole Hirsch who will, who will um, ask you questions. All right. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, Janet, for that really just wonderful presentation. There's so much depth and knowledge and I know there's quite a few people and including myself who are so glad it's recorded so that we can go back and just glean more from it. Yeah. Uh, so first off, uh, let's see, we have a, a lot of questions of, of interest in deer resistant plants mm -hmm. and rabbit resistant plants, which I think there's some concerns about the increase in deer and rabbit populations in you know, urban and suburban settings. So if you can offer any advice um, for gardening with critters. Right, that's really interesting. First of all, I'll tackle the rabbit problem because honestly, I don't know what you can grow. They're, they will eat just about anything. Maybe if you have a trap crop of you know, vegetables like that you don't mind sacrificing over there, that will be the uh, best way. There is, we have rabbits really bad in the nursery. And so it's, it's a huge problem for us. Um, and that's worse some years than others. Last year, 
whatever it was about the weather, rabbits exploded worse than I've ever seen them. So having said that, it's not as bad every year. There is a product called Liquid Fence, which is a deer rabbit repellent. And you can't, it's one of those stinky sprays that the smell goes away after you spray it. And it does, I have dogs and cats and animals. It doesn't hurt any other animals, but it does it repel them. They do not like the smell. So I would suggest, first of all, that if you can't fence, which is what all of us have to do where I live, uh, and if you don't hunt them, which some of us do or won't, can't or whatever, then your best bet is to probably use a deterrent. And even when I plant what I call deer resistant plants, like people say, oh, deer don't eat that. I promise you when they are hungry, they will. I have plants that I cannot believe they eat in the winter. I've never seen them eat before. And really that's just the increase in numbers and the lack of things for them to eat. So I would just say try liquid fence for rabbits. And then there's another product called Deer Defeat. And that's available online, not in stores. Liquid Fence is in stores. And you can order Deer Defeat. And that's really a superior product for deer repellent. Great, thank you. Um, so, and you know, I think we had talked about this early on, but if you could just reiterate what a native plant is, because I've seen uh, quite a few uh, questions about that. And I think you would like to sort of understand what we're talking about. All right, so let's, let's go back to maybe square one on what a native plant is. There are lots of plants that grow here really well, but they are not, they did not originate here in this part of the world. Uh, in North America or in the Mid-Atlantic or in Virginia. So really things that we think of are native plants are plants that have co-evolved over long periods of time with the with all the fauna, the other animals and insects. They These plants have been here in this part of the world for a long period of time, co-evolving with that those insects and other animals so that there's unique relationships that have evolved over time that bringing a plant from another part of the world, Africa, China, you know, whatever, when you bring those plants here, they have not co-evolved here or lived here. They might grow here because the soil's fine or the conditions are fine, but they do not support the complexity of, of those, the, that co-evolution in those communities. So the plants that we're talking about in our specific purposes right here where we all live, would be plants that have evolved here over long periods of time. And they were here before Europeans started coming and settling in America. And the reason I say that, I have a 16 year old, for example, who just is taking AP world history. And even they talk about that. As soon as Europeans started doing colonization, going sailing around the world, figuring out the world was round and not flat, they started really doing a lot of scientific analysis and sharing and moving plants. So that means that plants might've started showing up here maybe in the 16 or 1700s, but they weren't native to here. They were just brought in. So we're talking about plants that were here for a long period of time. Technically, we think about that as before Europeans came. Hopefully that's given everybody a little better definition. Yes, thank you. That's very helpful. So next, early on in your presentation, you talked about um, winterizing your garden and uh, spring cleaning and Few folks had asked about some more details about that and the timing of things and sort of what activities are advisable during what periods. Um, so if you could speak more to that, that'd be great. Sure. The old school way of thinking, and even to some extent master gardener programs now, which kind of gets my goat a little bit. There's this old school thing and you kind of go out in the fall and you trim everything down, all those spent perennial heads and you clean it all up. and and you make sure you reapply your mulch or whatever you're using. That is old school and we know way better. So when we're talking about native plants and how we're supporting habitat, we're really talking about that food chain. We're talking about insects and butter, lots of different butterflies or insects that overwinter, maybe as adults, but maybe as pupa or some other you know, form. They're in the leaf litter. That's where they go down to the ground to be warm or they're laying their eggs and over, overwintering as a pupa in the hollow stem of some of these native plants. So when we cut everything down in the fall and rake it all out and haul it over to the compost pile or the burn pile or whatever down in the woods, we've just eliminated that entire next generation of insects 
the insects that are going to come out and pollinate for us, or they're going to come out and be the butterflies that we want to look at, or they're going to be the food for the birds or whatnot. So the better time to do that kind of garden cleanup would be later in the spring, right when the new growth is starting to come out. And what I really recommend to people is you, you go out and you cut those stalks and things at about six inches from the ground. And then you can even just lay them in your garden or break them into smaller pieces and maybe kind of move them around, but use them as part of your mulch. You're going to throw seeds down by doing that. You're going to encourage more reseeding. So it's a different kind of cleanup. It's not this neat knit kind of perfect stuff that we were sort of taught. And for those of us who are sort of, you know, OCD about that, which would include me, I've really had to learn to say, I can't do that. Now I've, I haven't been cleaning up my garden for years. So I, I at least have learned that some long time ago, but it's, it's much better to sit on your deck or up on your patio and have a glass of wine and to just watch all those seed heads all winter. If you really need to trim them up, what we recommend to people is you go out to the hardware store and you get the, a tomato cage and they make some really pretty tomato cages that are red or hot pink or yellow. You can get them in you know, little three ring metal tomato cages in different colors. Stick that out in the middle of your garden. If you need to cut those stalks, if you need to trim that stuff up, cut them, then go over to your tomato cage and create a dried flower arrangement. Stick all those stalks in there. It looks like art. You've kept the stalks upright. You've protected them from falling on the ground and molding or rotting. You haven't thrown them into your compost pile. So now you're keeping any potential insects that are in those stalks. You've kept them upright. And you made kind of a cool dried flower arrangement in this really pretty tomato cage. I do this all the time and people just think it's really brilliant. I, you know, I'm not brilliant, but it's just a way of keeping the stalks off the ground. So you wanna keep stalks really off the ground as much as possible. So you really don't even wanna cut them till spring. And if you can create your tomato cages, even in the spring while your new growth comes around, or certainly if you had to do a cleanup next to your sidewalk or something, use that tomato cage method in the fall. Um, if you need to edge your bed or remulch the edges or do something because you're trying to keep, keep that clean, certainly you can do that kind of stuff in the spring, but really just learn to live with your prunings and your trimmings and let that become sort of compost in place. Hopefully that helps people a little bit. Yes, awesome, thank you. Um, so this is a personal favorite question of mine is people really like mowing. They get great <laughs> satisfaction from mowing. And so how do we address this as a barrier when this is sort of the cultural regime that we're used to? And, you know, I think it's sort of therapy for some people. It's you know, you see instant results in a mowed lawn. And so do you have any ideas for sort of switching the, the thought process about mowing? I'm saying this a little bit tongue in cheek, but hear me out. Volunteer to your local high school and see if they'll let you, or your local sports club and see if they'll let you mow the soccer fields or do something else to get your instant gratification. So, I mean, I, I live in a small community. My daughter played soccer all these years and like, they always needed somebody to come and mow, you know, at the, at the rec soccer league. So I'm, Maybe there's ways to get that instant gratification. And I'm not saying that we can have no lawn. That's another thing. Maybe we need less lawn. So instead of mowing your five acres or your you know, quarter acre, maybe you, you mow a smaller area of it where you have your, your patio garden you know, spilling out into the grass or you have a place to throw frisbees with your kids or whatever. And so you can still have some mowing time and not spend the money on a big tractor or lawnmower that has to be out there and then go spend that money on a vacation or something fun. So that's one thing. The other thing is if you start in putting, putting meadows in or you start maybe volunteering with other community organizations that are installing meadows, like some nonprofits, an example would be near Warrington, Virginia is the Clifton Institute. My husband was there today helping them burn off some of their meadows. And for Many people, and I, I hate to say, I hate to make this male or female, but I often find this is a male thing. If you give them a drip torch and let them go participate in doing some burning, they will quickly give up mowing. <laughs> There's something really exciting about being able to participate in a burn. So um, I know that's a little tongue in cheek, but I do mean that. There are some alternative things that maybe we could all 
learn to, to be a part of, and then maybe we can shrink our lawn as opposed to having as much, and then you can still get your mowing fixed. Um, and then maybe there's a way that you might even find uh, a place to volunteer where there is mowing, appropriate mowing at a park or something. I mean, I realize some of us live in urban areas and that's not so much an issue, but maybe your church, you know? So if you need your mowing fixed, you maybe can get it somewhere else. I hope that's at least, all I know is we got to work to change the culture because it's the things that are really vital to our health, this enhanced livability that I'm talking about. It's not because I just like to look at birds and butterflies. I do, but I recognize that I personally am part of this ecosystem and it's dying in places around us. And I hate to be really stark about that, but I do feel like we all can maybe make a few sacrifices and get our fix maybe in a little bit less or a lot slightly different way. And we can still do uh, things that are gonna help you know, improve our environment. Great, thank you. Um, and I, there's actually a follow-up question to that and folks that are interested in planting meadows um, on septic drains. And uh -huh. so that is a traditional turf um, place where grass is found in uh, residential settings. And so do you have any suggestions for retrofitting uh, turf septic well, fields? Oddly, oddly enough, we've been told for a really long time that you need turf that you mow over top of your drain field. And there's actually some research saying that's not entirely true. And the North American Native Plant Society a few years ago, uh, a past president of the Virginia Native Plant Society, Nikki Stanton, a founder of the Virginia Native Plant Society, wrote a white paper on installing and growing meadows over septic fields. So there's even seed mixes specifically designed to grow over drain fields and septic fields. If you go to the uh, website of Ernst Conservation Seeds, E-R-N-S-T, Ernst Conservation Seeds, you can look up, they have a million different seed mixes, but they have one specifically for over drain fields. So there are appropriate native species for meadows over drain fields. Uh, I will say that if you're installing or trying to convert grass to a meadow, there's a fair amount of work to getting rid of the grass or to, or to getting rid of the weeds that might exist there before seeding a meadow. So you wanna be a little careful if you're on your drain field, you don't wanna do any plowing or anything like that. And in some cases, smothering will work. And in other cases, maybe you, you might have to resort, resort to a, a herbicide. And there's different ones that are appropriate for different locations. And so you, Ernst, again, at their website, will have a lot of information about installing meadows. And we'll also have some seed mixes for um, drain fields. Awesome, great, thank you so much. Um, and then I just want to remind everybody that this is being recorded and the recording will be sent out. Um, so if you're not catching all this, because I know I definitely am not, uh, you'll be able to refer back to it. Um, okay, so this is maybe more geared towards our, our urban um, partners on the call, but there was some interest in how do you incorporate uh, native plants into small urban yards where you're also interested in growing fruit and veggies. And can you incorporate natives into annual vegetable gardens? Absolutely. First of all, anytime any of you want to come to my house and just go see my vegetable garden, which is a bit of a mess sometimes, I, first of all, vegetables for the most part have to be pollinated or a lot of them have to be pollinated. So what better than to have really good native plants with a, that have a, you know, very attractive to pollinators to be in there. So then you're pulling pollinators into your garden by having flowering plants there, but you're also potentially attracting, depending on the plants, attracting predatory insects, which are gonna maybe work to help control your pests on your vegetables. So absolutely, you can sometimes underplant or interplant, I would call that. What I do is I have a bit of a border in areas around my garden that I have had different pollinator plants in particular, the mountain mints, I mentioned before, short tooth mountain mint is the long blooming sort of, sort of a plant with like powdery white on the top when it goes to flower. It looks like it's been dusted with baby powder or something, but it blooms for a really long period of time. And I had a beekeeper say to me that 
that that mountain mint, short tooth mountain mint was B kale. It was like the vitamins that her bees ate. She had healthy hives, even with, you know, varroa mites and colony collapse. She really had healthy hives and she had a ton of that mountain mint. So I'm using that as an example of how you can keep you know, good complex of insects there to help with pollination and so forth. So you can carve out an area. You can even do this in pots. You might have remember the slide that I showed of my back door and I had a little frog that was living down in the bottom of the plants. Those were both native plants, two different species, but there were many stalks of each one. And that's just in a planter on my back porch. And it stays there year round. When it starts to get warmer, I'll trim the dead out of there and it'll all grow back. I might throw a little plant tone or organic uh, composty kind of material because it is in a pot, it needs a little extra fertility. So you, even in urban settings and small places, you could do container gardening and create what we call meadow in a pot of a couple of mix of species, or you could grow those around your small vegetable garden. And one last thing I'll say is there are a number of native species which are fruit bearing, uh, which you might be interested in. Blueberries, high bush and low bush blueberries, those are native plants. So if you're growing blueberries, even if it's a cultivar, you are growing a native species. Uh, pawpaw is another native tree that you eat the fruit of. Service berry is a native tree that has a fruit that's edible. It's very much like a blueberry, but it ripens in early June. Those are just a couple of examples of things that you might think about how you can expand your fruit and your fruit palette by having native species that are actually fruiting. That's a little bit. Great, thank you. And I know we had questions about growing natives in pots. So I think you touched on that a little bit as well. I just want to remind folks that we are only taking questions in the question answered uh, box and that uh, we're, we're not gonna call on raised hands. So if you'd like to pose a question, if you could type it in and uh, we will get to it as we are able to. Um, and let's see. So we have uh, an interest in hearing you talk more about sort of the relationship between invasive and native species and how do you manage invasives while planting native plants and how, how does that affect biodiversity? And um, if you could just speak a little bit to switching over the ecosystem and what that experience is like and any advice in doing that. So I had a big argument with, <laughs> with a conservation person many, many, many years ago because um, their position was that autumn olive, for example, because it does fruit and the birds are eating it, that we should be leaving it while we're planting other natives until they mature. And the problem with that thinking is that many, the reason those plants are invasives <laughs> is because they reproduce way faster. There is some, uh, there's some uh, biological edge. For example, autumn olive leaps out in the spring, way ahead of our native species, spice bush, for example, and other things that you'll see in the similar conditions. And so it has a little bit of a competitive edge. That doesn't make it a better plant. That just means that it's not co-evolved here. It is not in balance with our native species. Therefore, it blows in and just sort of, you know, muscles its way in. So if we leave that plant as it's rapidly reproducing and displacing natives, and the birds are continuing to eat it, we're not doing them any favors. It's sort of like we're feeding them candy when, and we may in fact be hurting them before they migrate, for example, or before they overwinter. So I think it's an important, a two-pronged approach is important. Removing invasives, especially ones that are particularly aggressive, that would be porcelain berry, it's a very aggressive vine, oriental bittersweet. If you're out there and you are, decorating or making wreaths with oriental bittersweet and folks you know who you are i'm gonna beg you please stop that is one of the worst invasive vines out there so that kind of thing autumn olive for example those things are really making giant impacts in our habitat and uh we've got to get rid of them i mean so you can i'm working with a client right now up in the per percival loudon county area and she has a creek area that she's got to do some, you know, control of washout. It's very wet there. And it is an old farmstead part, that part. It is just entirely Japanese honeysuckle and English ivy all on the ground, all up in the trees. And it, it's, a, it's virtually impossible to, 
without having a giant crew of people to get rid of it. So I said, you know, let's think of this as a phased approach. Let's do the most critical areas first. We're going to pull things out. And as soon as we pull it out, we're going to put erosion control and we're going to get sedges or plants right in that. So it could be a two-pronged approach is better for most of us. If we can get rid of some of the most egregious natives, meanwhile, planting at least some stout, strong-shouldered, rather quick-growing natives, short-tooth mountain mint is another great example of that, that maybe we can do a little bit of this two-pronged approach. But I would say if we're not eliminating invasives, the ones that are really the worst actors, we're not making any headway by planting natives because the invasives are going to repopulate in those native places. I, I, I walk out into my garden if I'm not paying attention and I'll have a tree of heaven six feet tall in the middle of my, you know, shrub border. I didn't even know it was there because it's been hiding out, but it's just like, it's in there. So if I don't control that, if I just say, oh, it's not important, that's going to really become a bigger problem. So sometimes it's going to require herbicide. I hate to say that if you do the cut and swipe where you cut plant off and you paint brush the cut, you do not spray, you do not put it on soil and you just cut the swipe. If you can do that, that is really probably the best use of chemistry out there. Other cases, it's just uh, cancel your subscription to the gym and control your invasives and you'll be in great shape. <laughs> awesome, love that answer. Um, so we're sort of, you know, had some warmer weather lately and getting super excited about planting season. And so some folks wanted to hear about preparing our gardens. Um, and then you also mentioned um, digging up compost from the fo forest floor. Yeah. Is that, and so, uh, and so people wanted to hear more about that. So if you could talk about sort of soil and preparation. Right, soil is really the bottom building block of any food chain. If your soil, if you take care of your soil, your plants are gonna grow. I'm not a proponent of fertilizers in general. Uh, so, one of the best ways to build soil for any kind of garden, whether it's your vegetables or your perennials or your native plants, shrub or anything, is to just use some really good leaf compost, whether it's shredded leaves that you can uh, shred from your own yard in the fall and then pile them up on a bed and let them decompose all winter, whether you have them in a pile out somewhere and you can sort of dig into that and rake that out, bring that into your, uh, your planting bed areas, that's a, a great, Really, that's a black gold. That's the best way to start. If you need to use an organic fertilizer, I highly recommend plant tone or biotone. Uh, that's uh, holly tone is for acid loving plants. Those are probably really readily available organic. Uh, they're chicken poultry based, uh, but still natural fertilizers. Um, I don't recommend tilling. I never recommend tilling. If you're gonna convert grass to a garden, it's best to stage that. So define the space, use a hose, maybe to lay it out so you know what the edges of it are gonna be if, if, if you need to. Mow or weed eat the grass all the way down to the nub, down to the ground, and just leave the clippings in there and lay uh, cardboard or lots of thick layers of newspaper on top of that. And then put shredded leaves or wood chips or something on top of that and let it sit at least a few months, three to four months and then let that sort of break down. And then you can plant into that the following season. So if you create that garden site in the fall, you can plant it in the spring, for example. So right now it's spring. It could be that if you're trying to plant something that's not prepped, maybe you can skim some of that grass off and throw it in an area to compost, let it compost. And then you can, uh, you know, broad fork or just loosely, uh, you know, top dress with some uh, leaf compost, you know, a couple of inches. And as you dig your holes, it's going to work into the ground as you plant your plants. If, if that space has not been already prepared. If you have heavy clay and hard pack kind of soils, the absolute best amendment that you can use is called pelleted gypsum. G-Y-P-S-U-M. Gypsum is what they make drywall, wallboard out of. So this is just sort of a heavy powder when they say pelleted. It's not like big pellets. If you sprinkle a good layer of that on top of your garden site or your heavy clay or your packed, and then maybe some leaf compost, and then you just dig that. You don't need to till that. Just as you're digging your holes and getting your plants and let it just sort of work in. That gypsum is a great, it sort of breaks up the chemical bonds of the clay so that it helps to aerate clay. It's not a fertilizer. It's actually just an amendment, a, a, a mineral. 
So that's the kind of things that I would recommend for getting ready to go now. One quick thing, as a nursery grower, I've had people trying to call me and come get plants for a couple of weeks. Yeah, it feels like spring and it's really warm and maybe we're going to have spring from here on out, but plants really kind of need to adjust to the wind and get hardened off. We have lots of plants that overwintered outside that are ready to go in the ground now. They don't look like much, but they're perfectly healthy. Stuff that's coming out, and this includes your vegetable plants, you know, let them harden off, let them get used to the wind, let them get used to that bright sun, and then it's going to be cold. We might even have snow here at my house on Monday. Do not be fooled by 70 degrees tomorrow. <laughs> Still pay attention to that. Awesome. Thank you. Um, and there are some other folks that are, you know, really excited about spring. They're curious if there's any native uh, flowering bulbs that they should know about, as well as uh, those early bloomers to sort of extend yeah. that pollinator habitat season. So if you could speak to that, please. Some of the earliest uh, flowering plants will be things that you would see in the forest. And actually the forest right now and for the next several weeks will be really will be sunny because the leaves are not out on the trees yet. So the kinds of things that we'll see really early are things that we think of as sort of spring ephemerals. They come up now while they have the sunlight, they flower, they set their seed and so forth. And then they're slowly going to die back to the ground, say a little bit later, late spring or early summer. So that would be bloodroot, um, twin leaf, hepatica. It's not truly an ephemeral, but it does sort of, sort of decline as the summer comes on. That was the photograph that here when everybody was logging into the webinar, that little blue flower. That's hepatica. Uh, another one would be woodland flocks. It's an early fragrant brown cover flocks that early butterflies really like and early pollinators really nectar on. It's also really nice bright little pale purple to pale white blue uh, flower. That's really nice for early spring. And the other things that we think about for you know early kind of flowering for the early pollinators is the golden ragwort that I showed you with the yellow flowers. And I said it's deer resistant and grows under walnuts and it's a great ground cover. That's a fabulous one for early spring pollen and nectar. And another one called Golden Alexander, which is actually in the carrot family. And it's a little yellow flat top flower, similar to a, to a Queen Anne's lace or something. And that is also a host plant for some of our swallowtails. So, because it's in the carrot family. Uh, so those are some really early ones, but a lot of the earliest flowers are going to be those spring ephemerals. And that includes the Virginia bluebells. That's another big one that people are looking for. Trout lily, Dutchman's britches. Those are really nice things that you can get in mass early on. And then you come in behind that with foam flower, which is Tiarella. Um, and again, a little further in the season, you'll get into lots of other perennials that do better or, or you show up in the sun more so than in those shade, those areas that are sunny, but then become shady. Um, I had one thought I was going to share and then I have totally, oh, early right now, if you can actually go out and hike, you're not really going to get this in your garden because it's hard to propagate. Skunk cabbage is flowering in the winter. So it's been flowering in wet seeps and areas. So if you're out hiking, you might see this really funny, big fat leaf with a little spath of like speckly purple. And that's actually skunk cabbage. That's kind of a cool thing. Some of you may even have that on your property. So that's a really early one. So those are some of the earliest things in terms of bulbs before that's what it was um there's really you know trout lily is a little bit of a bulb for example um the other uh, uh like dutchman's britches are like little bulblets so there are things that are not technically bulbs like narcissus or tulips but they are bulb like structures and one that's a little further afield um there, there's a Virginia native one, but the better one, or the bigger ones that we know of are further in the Northwest. And that's called Quamash, Q-U-A-M-A-S-H. That's truly a bulb. Um, uh, Camassia is the Latin name. Camassia soloides is the local one. And just a little bit of trivia, Lewis and Clark, when they did the Northwest, you know, the um, during Thomas Jefferson's presidency and they went through the Northwest territory and, you know, out to find a passage all the way or whatever. And then came back three years later. A lot of the Native Americans in the Northwest would dig and eat that bulb, that Quamash bulb. And when Lewis and Clark came and said, okay, we're starving, we're gonna eat some of this too, <laughs> it gave them a lot of stomach cramps and an awful lot of problems because they were not used to eating that kind of diet. So I don't, it is an edible plant, but I don't recommend it because we're not used to that kind of diet. That's one of the few bulbs though, is Quamash. Beautiful purple flower though in April. 
Thank you. All, all the things to look forward to. And I, uh, I'm i in the New River Valley and I did hear that people have been seeing skunk, skunk cabbage already. So that's cool. great. Um, so we're, you know, a little bit past time here. Um, so if you don't mind, I'll just ask you one more question. Sure. Um, folks have been wondering about uh, the upcoming brood of cicadas and if there's any advice for planting new trees and shrubs um, in preparation for that, whether that's timing or protection. Right. Timing, definitely, if you can wait till later, uh, I think your timing is gonna be June maybe or later on planting. So you might wait till fall even. Containerized stock, you can plant really any time of the year as long as you can water it. If you do have some uh, woody shrub or trees, the, the cicadas, the damage that they do is the adult slits the bark and lays oviposits there. And so they really prefer uh, a diameter that's like a quarter inch roughly or, or to have three eighths of an inch or something like that. So they're not doing big, heavy, bigger wood. They're doing that sort of finger, little pinky size kind of. And so what'll happen is they'll oviposit say on the outer, like the outside 12 inches of a branch. And then that part will die oftentimes. So they do damage to trees in that you lose some of your canopy on a young dogwood, for example. And certainly they love to do that to dogwoods. That's one of their preferred food, uh, uh, host plants. So you can either order a netting that is a quarter inch netting. We actually had cicadas emerge here about eight or nine years ago here in Rappahannock County and we had just planted a bunch of trees that fall. So we went out, we ordered this roll of netting and again it has very small holes, it's like quarter inch, and we wrapped the trees that were fairly new that fall that we wanted to protect. And that did a great job. You just sort of wrap the tree and you band it and you just leave it there for you know, a month or six weeks till the cicadas are pretty much done. Otherwise you wait if you can't protect something young um, and then you just uh, can prune some, some trees that might've had some damage on the exterior parts of the branches, you could prune that out. They won't, it doesn't typically kill a tree um, because they're not going down into the heavier wood. They're up on the outer branches. It's just really kind of ruins the aesthetic of, of a small tree if you have to prune a lot of it out. Great. Well, thank you so much for taking all these questions and this wonderful presentation. Uh, it's been a great resource to us all in the state. It has been so much fun. I'm so grateful to everyone being here and have a great spring. Happy planting, everybody. Please, if you're in the neck of the woods at all, visit Hill House Farm and Nursery or go to our website and look at the, our schedule of events. I hope to meet a lot of you somewhere. All right. Thank you so much, Janet. We really, really, truly, I, I was so engaged <laughs> by your presentation. Yay! Um, and we really appreciate your time tonight. Um, we had a number of other questions and we'll, we'll try to follow up with those. Um, mm -hmm. And I uh, just wanted to thank everybody, all of our attendees again, and wanted to also point out um, that um, our next webinar will be on March 23rd. And we will have uh, Trista Emmerich um, talking about um, more landscape choices inspired by nature, including um, plants that are companions in nature's garden and would really be right at home together in your, yard, your garden. And um, anyhow, with that, we, Margaret, did you have some final words that you wanted to share? Uh, no, not really. Just thank you, Janice. It was really amazing. And it was like all of native plant gardening in one hour and a half. <laughs> amazing. Thank you. It's a good thing it was recorded because yes. we're all going to be going over and over. And, and yes. Thank you. Yes. Thank you so much. Well, good night, all. Bye, everyone. Thank you. See you next time.